When researchers in Times New York office protested the inaccuracy of the foreign news reports, Chambers habitually replied, quote, Truth doesn't matter, unquote. The facts had to be altered to fit his anti-communist crusade. Eventually, the correspondence protests resulted in, in an investigation, and Chambers was made an editor of, editor of special projects, a position he held until 1948 when he named Alger Hiss as a communist. Whatever views one may hold about the Hiss case, there is no doubt that Whitaker Chambers perjured himself during a grand jury investigation and changed his testimony repeatedly. During the first trial, when Lloyd Paul Stryker said to him, quote, lying comes easy to you, unquote, Chambers replied, I believe so. That's the end of the letter. So uh, keep in mind, Whitaker Chambers and his, uh, his anti-communist views, his right-wing views, and his systematic suppression of the very stories which we've been trying to resurrect for you uh, through, uh, from historical volumes, the stories of the active suppression by the Western allies of uh, anti-fascist partisan movements with whose politics they differed. And indeed, uh, only the tip of the iceberg is what we have time to deal for and deal with tonight. Okay, we're going to take a short break for about three and a half minutes. We'll be back with the last section of Looking Back from 1984, and uh, we hope you'll be back with me. This is Nip Tuck, and myself and Dave Emery will return with the final segment of the show in just a moment here on KFJC 89.7, Los Altos Hills. <laughs> And I certainly hope that those of you who had to get up and run around the block or go walk your guppy or something had the uh, presence of mind to turn on your tape recorder and save this for later days because this is, in essence, why we're doing this stuff. So, anyway, we will be announcing it toward the end of the show, time permitting the books we use tonight. So those of you who are interested in following up on some of this stuff, don't worry about that. Right now, we're going to get back into the subject at hand. And you may wonder, uh, those of you, as I mentioned before, who are beginning to lose the uh, particular forest of the Cold War for the trees of World War II politics, um, may also be wondering about the, uh, the, the Cold War in terms of the United States versus Russia and uh, such things as, oh, the, uh, the Iron Curtain and the, the bringing of Eastern Europe into the, 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 the fold of the Soviet wolf in sheep's clothing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and all the other stuff that we've all heard about. And that, in fact, ties right in with the partisan stuff, that, uh, the, those trends and patterns that we talked about, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this segment. Well, now, just as we saw the British Army actually take up arms against their nominal allies, the Greek partisans, by the same token, uh, there was already there was a division of loyalties with regard to the Allies and the Axis in Eastern Europe, which uh, basically resulted in World War II not actually coming to an end until almost 1952. One of the elements of history, very important elements of history, which has not been recorded, is the fact that the shooting war in Eastern Europe, and I'm talking about World War II, did not end in 1945 with VE Day. Basically, as the Nazis retreated on the Eastern Front in World War II, they set up guerrilla groups in the uh, in the Soviet in the rear of the Red Army to harass the Red Army, and these combined with the uh, various uh, domestic fascist and nationalist groups, and also with the uh, German troops cut off to wage a fierce guerrilla warfare in the rear of the Red Army, and this lasted until 1952 or 1950 by some accounts. I'm going to be reading you now a passage from a book called Galen, Spy of the Century. Galen is G-E-H-L-E-N. It's authored by a man named E.H. Cookridge, last name C-O-O-K-R-I-D-G-E, a former British intelligence agent. And Galen, Spy of the Century was copyrighted in 1971, and it was published in hardcover by Random House in that same year. Now, Galen, Reinhard Galen, was Adolf Hitler's chief of intelligence for the Eastern Front in World War II. We're going to talk about him more in just a second. Reading now from E.H. Cookridge's Galen, a Spy of the Century, 1971 Random House Edition. Inside the Soviet Union in Poland, large scattered groups of the whites, unquote, meaning anti-reds, had remained and were putting up a desperate fight. In southwest Ukraine and eastern Poland, bands of the nationalist UPA, many still with their German SS officers, harassed the Red Army, the Polish militia of the communist-dominated Warsaw government, <clears throat> and the local authorities set up in the liberated territories. At various times between November 1945 and the spring of 1947, these counter-revolutionary bandits, unquote, were in effective control of many villages and rural districts. <clears throat> 
Trained in guerrilla warfare by the Germans, they ambushed Soviet road convoys, used hit-and-run tactics, and carried out innumerable sabotage actions. Indeed, some of the Ukrainian insurgents held out in the forests of the Carpathian Mountains until 1952. The Soviet authorities also encountered trouble in the former Baltic states. After four years of Nazi occupation, many German soldiers, particularly of the Kurland Army, C-U-R-L-A-N-D, which had been cut off during the winter of 1944, had remained there. Together with Latvian and Estonian patriots, they now turned upon the Red Liberators, unquote. The Russians used ruthless, ruthless, ruthless methods to suppress the rebels, resorting to wholesale deportations of the indigenous populations. In Moscow's eyes, the insurgents were traitors who had been armed by the Nazis to fight against their own country. Today, this attitude might appear cruel, especially when taken with the atrocities the Soviet police are known to have committed against often innocent people. Yet it be, must be remembered that the French resistance members treated Nazi collaborators hardly more gently, and that even the British executed traitors after the war for perhaps lesser crimes, such as broadcasting anti-British propaganda from Berlin. Although the Soviet government announced that by the spring of 1947, quote, all counter-revolutionary fascist bands under German command had been annihilated, unquote, in fact, this was not so. For years, the communists kept silent about the extent of the fighting, which in many areas amounted to a minor civil war. Okay, remember that sentence. In many areas, it amounted to a minor civil war. It was not until 1959 that a Polish military writer published some staggering details about the widespread sabotage carried out by anti-communist bands and the heavy casualties suffered on both sides. And in a footnote to that passage, uh, Cookridge quotes that Polish military writer, a man named General Ignacy Blum, B-L-U-M. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the Polish name of the history that uh, he wrote that in, but uh, anyway, this, this following footnote to that passage by Cookridge. Report by General Ignacy Blum, Warsaw, 1959. He mentioned a figure of 12,556 killed and estimated the number of sabotage acts carried out in Poland by the anti-communist bands and werewolves, remember that name, werewolves, at 29,970. So we don't know what this raw figure is here, uh, 12,556 killed, whether those represent... <coughs> Uh, Red Army casualties in this guerrilla warfare, or just what it is that they represent. But uh, note that, that uh, here he's talking about 12, 13,000 people being killed. And uh, keep, in, <clears throat> keep in mind that, as Cookridge said, this guerrilla warfare in Eastern Europe, which, and again, these guerrilla groups, many of them were set up by the Nazis and coordinated by the OKW, German Military High Command, and that uh, basically this guerrilla warfare raged in Eastern Europe until 1952. Now, keep in mind the name werewolves, because that's something Nip Tuck's going to tell you about in a second. Okay, now bear in mind also that similarly to the, the Greek situation, similar to the Greek situation we just described to you, where before hostilities between the Axis and the Allied powers had formally ended in the E-Day, the British were already, in essence, having a shooting war with the partisans, the anti-fascist partisans in Greece, then in effect the, the British had already begun firing on the very people who had allowed them to quote-unquote liberate Greece. Um, it, at the same time, roughly, uh, we already see the United States um, beginning to make contacts with the very self-same Nazis that they are fighting on the Western Front uh, as they drive toward Berlin to make contact with them for the same purpose, notably to overthrow any incipient uh, anti-fascist, specifically leftist or Soviet-supporting governments that might come into power in Eastern Europe. So the plan on the part of the, the Americans, with the help, the help of the obviously unrepentant Nazis, is to prevent the kind of thing happening um, in in Eastern Europe that the British successfully uh, managed to overcome in Greece, namely the partisan forces coming to power as most of the populace doubtlessly wanted them to do. Remember Article 12 from the Treaty of Versailles to ending World War I, which, which established a pattern of allied German cooperation against Soviet Russia or against communism even as uh, Germany was being defeated. Now this section, this stuff that we're talking about here, in some ways is one of the most critical things toward an understanding, or at least an expanded understanding, of the Cold War. Now, as we have mentioned, and we mentioned at the beginning of the show, and we should mention again, 
By no means is this the entire story. However, what part of the story this is is the part that you are least likely to hear, um, not just if you're having lunch down at the Reagan Ranch, but virtually anywhere within the, uh, the political science departments of our universities or anywhere, not because it didn't happen, but because it's inconvenient and has been inconvenient for a long time. One of the main things that people say, and, um, and we're not going to try and convince you necessarily of anything, we'll let you make your own judgments, but one of the main things that people say these days is, well, if the Russians were such nifty people, if they weren't a bunch of creeps and murderers and killers, why did they take over Eastern Europe? Well, bear in mind the position of the Russian armies where they are have lost uh, probably 20 million people plus during World War II as a direct result of having been invaded by the Nazis. They're doing their best as they drive on Berlin to try and dismantle the fascist organizations all along their borders, some of which had been operating against the Russian, the Soviet Union since the end of World War One. Some of these self-same organizations in one shape or another in the same areas. And, oh, yes, go ahead. And to keep in mind, again, uh, the point can't be made uh, too strongly too often that the shooting war in Eastern Europe did not end when we were told it ended, that uh, instead of main force units operating along fixed battle lines, we had a uh, de-acceleration uh, of combat into small guerrilla, guerrilla units, but uh, as Kirkridge noted, that in many areas this amounted to a minor civil war, and the guerrillas ranged far and wide and had effective control of many areas. So while on one hand the, uh, the, the Americans and the British and the French rolled in and found themselves able to, uh, to occupy Germany and start to send the boys home again, put them on ships and send them back to the United States except for small occupation forces. The Russians, on the other hand, against uh, who themselves felt that in many ways World War II had been directed, that the, so that the Nazis had been directly built up as a hitman against the Soviet Union, for which there is some historical evidence. The Russians, on the other hand, uh, found their entire army strung out through Eastern Europe, uh, literally thousands of miles away from Moscow, with civil wars, fascist-led, fascist-supported, Nazi-led, Nazi-supported, and later on American-led and American-supported civil war going on all around them. Anyway, back to uh, a book called The General Was a Spy, also about Reinhard Galen. This book is by Heinz Hörner, and uh, this was uh, copyright by Hermann, this is by Hermann, uh, Heinz Herne, excuse me, and Hermann Zoling, Z-O-L-L-I-N-G, and Herne is spelled H-O-H-N-E, copyright 1971 by Coward McCann, and I'm not even going to try that one, Geogen, Incorporated, New York, a hardcover. Anyway, they're talking about Galen and the RSHA, which is the Reist, Sikreist Hauptamt, which is the, Reist, the Reich uh, Secret uh, Security Bureau. And it says... Galen ultimately became so close an ally of the RSHA that during the death throes of Adolf Hitler's regime, he, together with the SS, with SS officers Skorzeny and Prutzmann, was charged with military direction of that macabre partisan and resistance organization known as Werewolf, intended to spread panic among the enemy. And an order dated November 12, 1944, dealing with, quote, battle in the rear of the enemy, this is the Red Army, the Army General Staff Operations Section laid down that foreign armies east from the Hera Ost will be responsible for cooperation with the RSHA on all matters concerning forward intelligence units. On February 6, 1945, the strategic group of the General Staff urged Army groups to support werewolf energetically, saying, quote, all units in whose vicinity werewolf groups are located will take measures for the supply and welfare of the werewolf groups concerned. Anyone so determined to continue to the bitter end could be sure of the approbation of his superiors. Galen climbed several rungs of the ladder. He was promoted to Major General. He became Deputy Chief of the Strategic Group of the General Staff. He was even entrusted with a General Staff Security. In the event of catastrophe, he was to arrange for the staff's immediate evacuation. Now, this is interesting in light of some stuff Dave is going to tell you about Reinhard Galen. It's also interesting in light of some of the stuff we've covered on other public affairs shows here at KFJC, uh, detailing where exactly the remains of the German general staff and the Nazi high command uh, were in fact immediately evacuated to at the end of World War II, and most of them were into the safe and loving arms of the Western intelligence forces. 
Okay, now take note of the fact uh, in that passage that uh, this fellow Reinhard Galen was very close to the RSHA, the Reichsicherheits Hauptamt. That basically, the RSHA was the SS Security Department. It incorporated something called the SD, the SS Intelligence Service, and the Gestapo. Okay, so the RSHA was basically perhaps the single most infamous institution of the Third Reich. The final solution was uh, the, the extermination of European Jewry was accomplished under RSHA auspices. Uh, the RSHA main facility at Wannsee was where the final solution was drawn up. And so uh, note the close cooperation between Galen and the RSHA. That means Galen was very, very close operationally and of necessity ideologically with the SS. And take note of the fact that uh, the werewolf guerrilla groups, which Galen set up with an SS man named Otto Skorzeny, were, like the other guerrilla groups in Eastern Europe, under the nominal command of OKW, Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, the German military high command. Now, Reinhard Galen <clears throat> was basically, he had reference to an organization called FHO. FHO is Fremde Herre Ost, or Foreign Armies East. That was Adolf Hitler's Eastern Front Intelligence Organization. It handled all of Hitler's Eastern Front Intelligence. Galen was in charge of Fremde Herre Ost. He was Hitler's chief intelligence officer against the Soviet Union. Now, three months after VE Day in Europe, three months after the war officially ended, and as we've seen, it did not end at that time, it officially ended, Reinhard Galen was flown into the United States in the uniform of a four-star general, and basically Galen and his entire Eastern Front Intelligence Organization, which was still in place at the end of World War II, were then grafted onto the fledgling CIA. And Galen and his entire organization, the former Fremdehera Ost, Hitler's Eastern Front Intelligence apparatus, complete and intact, and incorporating a great many of the white Russians who had initially opposed the Bolsheviks and then fled into Germany, leaving behind them an intelligence service. These, this, this organization, FHO, jumped to the fledgling CIA, became the de CIA's Department of Russian and Eastern European Affairs, the exclusive purveyors of intelligence on the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe for more than a decade after World War II. It then became the official NATO intelligence organization, providing NATO with up to 70% of its intelligence on Russia and Eastern Europe. And then it became the Bundesnachrichtendienst, the BND, the West German Intelligence Service, which it is for this day. And two very important details to remember about Galen. Number one is the fact that uh, the Galen organization paved the way for more than 4,000 SS and Gestapo men to move up into the U.S. intelligence system, where many of them remain to this day. The second fact to remember is the fact that Reinhard Galen not only set up many of these guerrilla groups which waged war until the early 50s in uh, the Ukraine and Poland and Eastern Europe, but Galen was in radio contact with many of these groups throughout the closing days of, this, of the Third Reich and clean on up into his tenure with the CIA. And not only that, but Galen and his CIA sponsors were shipping weapons and liaison officers to these guerrilla groups while they were fighting against our wartime allies, the Soviet Union, so that basically the Eastern Front guerrillas simply jumped to the United States with Galen. In essence, they continued to wage war throughout the closing days of the Third Reich and simply jumped uniforms. Basically, we picked up Hitler's tab in Eastern Europe. All right, this is a very important thing. Once again, getting to trying to point out the forest to people who are knee-deep in shrubbery again. Um, a, a key point to realize, and, and one of the major, one of the thesis points of this entire broadcast, again, not purporting to tell the entire story of the Cold War, but perhaps one of the most important sections of the story of the Cold War, which is virtually unknown and unrecognized in the United States. And that is not only was World War II to a large extent brought about because of the Western nations rearming Germany to continue their war against the Soviet Union for no other particular reason at that time than the Soviet Union being a, a Bolshevist, a Marxist government, or purportedly a Marxist government. Not only did they rearm Germany, but then after Germany had com con contributed, or had participated in the worst atrocities in the history of warfare on this planet,
um, many of which were were uh, perpetrated against the Soviet Union. Then, before the war was even over, the United States, in particular, was taking the the German High Command and especially the German Eastern Front intelligence services and all of the the, the fascist groups working for them, grafting them right onto their own intelligence service and sending them the weapons to continue on with what they were doing and the support. Okay, so in in essence. Um, one has to say, regardless of what other faults Stalin may have had, you certainly cannot call the man paranoid for feeling that he was getting a raw deal at the hands of the Allies. And again, now keep in mind the analogy with Central America today, where the hated Somocistas, uh, almost as soon as they had been uh, effectively defeated by the Sandinistas, were then rearmed, re-equipped, and... Uh, sent back into the fray, so to speak, by the United States. That they hear the very Because keep in mind how despised the Nazis, and particularly those Soviets who collaborated with the Nazis, where they were the most despised people possible. And by putting these people to work, or putting these people right back to war, in essence, underwriting the continued guerrilla warfare that began under Third Reich auspices and proceeded under CIA auspices, we were simply, we were obviously ra- waving the red flag at the, at the bull, so to speak, Keep in mind also that everything we've heard about, we heard about the Soviet Union for more than 10 years after the end of the war came from Hitler's intelligence people. Indeed. All right, this next segment, which will indeed expand this idea a little bit, is from a book entitled The Belarus Secret, B-E-L-A-R-U-S, Belarus, by John Loftus. And this book was published by Alfred A. Knopf, or Knopf, in New York uh, in 1982 in hardback. This is a book we discussed some on some of our shows here at KFJC. Um, Mr. Loftus is a, uh, a former uh, Justice Department attorney, uh, worked for the Office of Special Investigations there, and he himself got involved with the, the, uh, the search for the trail of several Bielorussian Nazi collaborators who seem to be winding up in important positions in the U.S. Um, intelligence and, uh, and security forces after World War II, despite the fact that they had committed numerous war crimes. Anyway, he talks in part about uh, about the Galen organization and its early connections with the then uh, the OSS and other groups of that type. I think the CIC, I think it was at that time. CIC is the Counterintelligence Corps. Right, I don't know if that's right. mentioned here, but that, this was pre-CIA, of course, because um, the, the Galen organization joined the CIA almost at its inception, so the early contacts were, were uh, predated the existence of the CIA. Much of, uh, the, you also hear reference to something called the Office of Policy Coordination, which was uh, a body of the now U.S. national security apparatus through which the CIA and Galen organization received much of their funding. And that, that organization was, uh, I think, under the direction of Frank Wisner. Right? Frank Wisner, a CIA official who Nip's going to tell you about in a second. Indeed. So you'll hear Wisner's name, and that is him, the Office of Policy. At the end of the last war, Loftus writes, many members of the OUN, which is a Ukrainian fascist anti-Soviet group, came to Western Europe to avoid capture by the advancing Soviets. The OUN reformed in Western Europe with its headquarters in Munich. It first came to the attention of American authorities when the Russians demanded extradition of Bandera and many other anti-Soviet Ukrainian nationalists as war criminals. Luckily, the attempt to locate these anti-Soviet Ukrainians was sabotaged by a few far-sighted Americans. Who warned, the American, who warned the person's concern to go into hiding. Now this is, by the way, I should mention this particular passage is from a letter by Frank Wisner. This is not the author saying, luckily, a few far-sighted Americans warned these Ukrainian war criminals. Frank Wisner is. Uh, Wisner's letter continues. From 1945 to 1948, members of OUN and of UPA, another similar group, arrived from the Soviet Ukraine to western Germany on foot. The messages they and returning German prisoners of war brought conclusively confirmed that the OUN and the UPA were continuing the fight against the Soviets with the weapons and ammunition which the retreating German armies had left behind. Over 35,000 members of the Russian secret police, the MVD and the MKGB, this again according to Wisner's letter, have been killed by OUN and UPA since the end of the last war. In other words, the main activities of the OUN and the Ukraine cannot be considered detrimental to the United States. Now, keep in mind that casualty figure. The Polish military writer quoted by E.H. Kukrid cited cited just a a raw figure of 12,556 killed. Didn't say whether those were Red Army casualties or overall casualties or whatever. But here in Wisner's letter, 
he cites the figure of 35,000 Soviet security forces killed just in the Ukraine, just in the period 1945 to 1947. Now, while he he was uh, lobbying for the employment of this group and might have exaggerated the figures accordingly, keep in mind that we're talking about a continuation of World War II. We're not talking about a sniper or two here. Indeed. Wisner's letter, John Loft is the author, writes, must have caused a commotion at the INS. That's the Bureau of Immigration and Naturalization. It was as close as he dared come to disclosing that he was using CIA money and CIA cover to provide, quote, left behind arms and ammunition to underground assassination teams inside Eastern Europe. But that was not all. The letter conclusively established that Wisner lied to the INS. It fraudulently claimed that the OUN was not a Nazi-sponsored organization and that its members had never collaborated with the Germans. At the end of several paragraphs of fictional history, Wisner stated, quote, In simple terms, the Germans wanted from the Ukrainians only food and supplies for their armies and forced labor for their factories. The Germans used all means necessary to force the cooperation which the Ukrainians were unwilling to give. Thus, by summer 1941, a battle raged on Ukrainian soil between two ruthless exploiters and persecutors of the Ukrainian people, the Third Reich and Soviet Russia. The OUN and the partisan army it created in late 1942, UPA, fought bitterly against both the Germans and the Soviet Russians. Okay, now before I go on to continue with Loftus' analysis, let me point out there's a little double whammy in there that you may not have picked up. Okay, so Wisner is writing to the Bureau of Immigration and Naturalization that they should let these people in because not only have they killed 35,000 members of the Russian secret police, according to him, but that, in, in effect, that anything bad that they did during World War II, they were forced to do by the Germans, and hence they were not bad people themselves, but just forced to by the bad Germans. Now, the double whammy here is not only is he lying about that fact, because as we're going to find out, Loftus is going to point out what eager collaborators they were, but in effect... Wisner and the rest of the people at OPS and the rest of the people in OSS and the other groups had already begun bringing the Germans in. So they had no objection to the Germans, and they're just using that as a, as a way of holding up the, uh, the, the Ukrainians as being somehow not to blame. They're going to blame it on the Germans, and they're just keeping it entirely secret, their collaborations with Galen and such other German, uh, Germans of note as Klaus Barbie and others that we've talked about on, the, on this uh, station before. Anyway, Loftus goes on to say of this claim, this was a complete fabrication. The CIC had an agent who photographed 11 volumes of the secret internal files of OUN Bandera. That's the Ukrainian group. These files clearly show how most of its members worked for the Gestapo or SS as policemen, executioners, partisan hunters, and municipal officials. The OUN contribution to the German war effort was significant, including the raising of volunteers for several SS divisions. It was precisely because of its work with the Nazis that Wisner wanted to hire the OUN for his special forces. The Ukrainian letter succeeded in fooling the immigration officials, however, and OUN Bandera was subsequently taken off the inimical list. In other words, they were made uh, available for, for permission to immigrate. By the time the DP Act expired in 1952, 400,000 immigrants had come to the United States. Among them were important Nazi collaborators from Bielorussia, the Ukraine, the Baltic states, and the Balkans, including the nucleus of Wisner's special forces. We're going to get to that next show. During the same four-year period, Wisner's OPC enjoyed virtually unlimited freedom of action and had grown to the point that it was consuming more than half the CIA's annual budget. Wisner's private army had launched an undeclared war against the Soviet Union. Does that sound familiar? He had defied the congressional ban on smuggling Nazis. He had misappropriated government funds to buy arms for ex-Nazi terrorists. And he had obstructed justice by sheltering fugitive war criminals who had been denounced by the Nuremberg Tribunal, the United Nations, and the Congress of the United States. So once again, again, we have to draw this parallel here, this unbroken line of policy dating from practically the very moment that the, uh, that the, the, the Bolshevists... In, uh, in Russia took over the, uh, the imperial palace and, and moved into the government. Uh, 
we see an almost unbroken policy of fear and loathing on the part of the Western nations, the United States. We see Herbert Hoover and Charles Evans Hughes and others carrying on uh, an undeclared war against the Soviet Union. We see this undeclared war continuing on through the 30s and uh, through the offices of various industrialists supporting the fascists uh, to stomp out any moves towards Sovietism in, in Europe. We see it right through World War II, where even during the course of the battle, the partisans who are um, the anti-fascist partisans are thrown out of power, and power is handled promptly back to the fascists under the control of the Allies. And we see it at the end of World War II, where the entire German Eastern European intelligence force is grafted onto the CIA, and the uh, collaboration and the support of 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 fascist guerrilla groups in Eastern Europe um, and, and a continuous civil war against the Soviet Union before they've even reached Berlin uh, is carried on as official American policy through Reinhard Galen right up through 1952. Good. And again, uh, d just remember that the, these guerrillas were set up by the Third Reich, then, a, then were jumped to the CIA uh, while maintaining a continuous state of warfare, and received weapons and liaison officers from CIA, and this undeclared war that Wisner was wage, waging really represented a continuation of the combat of World War II, a point uh, which just... It, it's such an important point that uh, I'd like to stress that again. Keep it in mind, because you never hear any of this uh, talk about the guerrilla warfare in Eastern Europe. Okay, a couple of uh, other interesting details about that guerrilla warfare. I can read you a footnote from a book called Farewell America. Farewell America is about the assassination of President Kennedy. It uh, is listed under the name of James Hepburn, last name H-E-P-B-U-R-N. There's no such person as James Hepburn. As it turned out, James Hepburn is the pen name for the French Overseas Intelligence Service, S-D-E-C-E. -E. And uh, this book, Farewell America, was in fact put out by the French Intelligence Service, and it was uh, published by an organization called Frontiers Publishing Incorporated and copyrighted 1968. Frontiers Publishing is uh, from Liechtenstein. Okay, so uh, this book is, is actually about the assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, it was brought into the United States by a French intelligence agent named Hervé Lamar, L A M A double A L A M A double R. And uh, Lamar made contact with a Bay Area assassination researcher and former FBI agent named William W. Turner who uh, we've talked about uh, on other programs on this station. And basically, he brought in this book called Farewell America, ostensibly written by James Hepburn, actually written by the French Intelligence Service. Now, in uh, a chapter of Farewell America concerning the U.S. intelligence apparatus, there's some discussion of Galen, and specifically some discussion of the guerrilla warfare in Eastern Europe that uh, basically went from the Third Reich and then was uh, the sponsorship of which was assumed by Galen and his CIA sponsors. And a little, an interesting story here about one of the casualties in this guerrilla warfare in Eastern Europe. Again, from Farewell America, ostensibly authored by James Hepburn, actually authored by the French intelligence service SDECE. Galen, who had conceived the idea of the Vlasov Army, Russian anti-communist troops, was given the responsibility for the underground that continued, continued to operate behind communist lines until 1950. In Poland, Galen's guerrillas on March 28th 1947 murdered General Karl Swierczynski, S-W-I-E-R-C-Z-E-N-S-K-I, Vice Minister of Defense, who, under the name of Walter, had commanded the 14th International Brigade in Spain, and who served as the model for one of the characters in Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls. Okay, so uh, next time you see Gary Cooper and Ingrid Bergman uh, in that uh, famous major motion picture version of For Whom the Bell Tolls, and you see Gary Cooper uh, shooting and spitting his defiance at the fascists at the end, keep in mind that uh, Galen dispatched one of the members of their group in actual combat, not on the movie screen, uh, during this guerrilla warfare we're talking about in Eastern Europe. A couple of other things uh, concerning that uh, guerrilla warfare. Now, I've got the last two uh, quotes I'm going to read you here uh, concerning that guerrilla warfare come from a book called The Borman Brotherhood. The Borman Brotherhood was authored by another former British intelligence agent named William Stevenson, last name S-T-E-V-E-N-S-O-N. -E -E now, this William Stevenson is not to be confused with another British intelligence agent named William Stevenson, who's S T E. P H E N S O N. That William Stevenson is called is known was known as Intrepid. He was in charge of all British intelligence uh, in the new in uh, the Americas during World War II. This is a di different William Stevenson who also writes about World War II intelligence, 
He wrote about the Third Reich and also was a British intelligence agent. Different spelling. Now, William Stevenson's The Borman Brotherhood was published in hardcover by Harcourt Brace Jovanovich in 1973 and in softcover by Bantam Books in 1974. Now, I'd like to read you an interesting detail here from the softcover Bantam edition of... Uh, William Stevenson's The Borman Brotherhood. Now, recall that uh, one of the guerrilla groups that uh, Nip Tuck uh, was reading you about that Galen set up to harass the Red Army in its rear and which carried on this guerrilla warfare is also was alluded to in that uh, quote, uh, in that passage uh, quoted from a Polish military writer. One of, the, one of these guerrilla groups was called the Werewolves. Now, the Werewolves were comprised primarily of Hitler youth, Now, the interesting thing is that the werewolves had an interesting battle cry which was broadcast by uh, Joseph Goebbels' propaganda ministry during the closing days of the Third Reich. And it's a battle cry that will be pretty familiar to the bunch of you, I think. Of the battle cry of the uh, werewolf guerrillas who uh, were set up by Galen and carried on guerrilla warfare in Eastern Europe after World War II. Officials who helped the enemy had to be publicly punished. It was the symbolism, as always, that counted. Radio Werewolf hammered the theme, Better Dead Than Red, a phrase that lived long after. Bolshevism was the real enemy. The Nazis had always resisted the Bolsheviks. Therefore, any German who helped the enemies of Nazism was helping the Bolsheviks and was a traitor. A climate was being created that would favor the concealment of wanted men. So again, the cry of Radio Werewolf, their battle cry, Better dead than red, and that is where the phrase better dead than red comes from. And, of course, that uh, is one of the mainstays of uh, sort of rabid anti That That phrase is one of the the, the watchwords of rabid anti-communism today. Now, uh, interestingly enough, the closing days of the Third Reich also saw the concoction, the uh, genesis of the phrase Iron Curtain. Now, most people believe that Winston Churchill concocted the phrase Iron Curtain. Churchill publicized the phrase Iron Curtain, but in point of fact, he actually borrowed it from a man named Count Lutz Schwerin von Krosik, last name K-R-O-S-I-G-K. Now, von Krosik was Hitler's last finance minister, succeeding Yalmar Schacht, and uh, in a closing, uh, in a propaganda broadcast during the closing days of the Third Reich, Count Schwerin von Krosik coined the phrase Iron Curtain. Winston Churchill borrowed it from him. Reading once again from The Borman Brotherhood by William Stevenson. The threat of war between the Western Allies and Russia had been promoted for years by the Nazis. Their vision of ultimate conflict with, quote, barbaric Bolshevism, unquote, produced the first reference to an Iron Curtain. It was uttered by Hitler's former finance minister, Count Schwerin von Krosik, on May 2, 1945, when he was desperately trying to win Allied recognition for the government of Admiral Dönitz. Schwerin von Krosik was an unctuous figure who had never forgotten Hesse's saying before his departure that the two Germanic nations, Britain and Germany, were fighting each other to the enormous satisfaction of the Bolsheviks. The Count, a former Rhodes scholar who seems to have learned nothing about the English during his time at Oxford, calculated that Hesse had made some some impression on his British hosts. The Iron Curtain moves closer, he declared in a broadcast. People caught in the mighty hands of the Bolsheviks are being destroyed, unquote. The term was picked up from the German broadcast. Churchill used it when he cabled President Harry Truman on May 12th. That's ten days after von Krosik used it in the broadcast. Quote, an iron curtain is drawn upon their front. We do not know what is going on behind, unquote. A year later, he dropped it into a speech in the United States. It demonstrates the infectious nature of the fears deliberately released by Hitler's followers in order to win Western sympathy. And so uh, the phrases, better dead than red and Iron Curtain, have their geniture in the closing days of the Third Reich. Worth noting in passing that the phrase, guns versus butter, was coined by Hermann Goering, the Reichsmarschall, when he said Germany needs guns, not butter. All of which, I guess, is to say that... uh, you know, these phrases, better dead than red, iron curtain, guns versus butter, are being kicked around quite a bit these days. When you hear them, remember where they come from, because the, uh, I guess you could say the lexicon of 20th century American anti-communism is the lexicon of the Third Reich. That's right. Not only in words, but in deeds also.
Okay, before we get, we're going we're gonna to recap two small things from the beginning of the show, but before we do that, we'll, we'll, I think we'll, we'll finalize the broadcast with that tonight. Before we do, uh, we're going to run down some of the sources that we use tonight on the broadcast, because um, after every show we do of this kind, we always get uh, lots of calls from people who want to know which book we got where, and which one is what, and where was it published, and who was the author, and things like that. And since we do have a few minutes left, this will give us an opportunity. Okay, um, we will also mention, and we'll, we'll try and give you an address of where you might be able to find copies of some of these books. Again, not a commercial suggestion, but just a, uh, there, are, there are only a few places to find most of the, the, uh, the earlier books, the ones written in the 40s. Some of the others are, uh, that have been published more recently you can find in your library or bookstore. Um, anyway, so first off. All righty, well, one of the books that uh, we were reading from is called Facts and Fascism. That was published in hardcover. Well, that's authored by George Seldes, last name L-S-E-L-D-E-S. -E published in hardcover by In Fact Incorporated, copyrighted, 1943. Also a book called The Great Conspiracy. There are a lot of editions of that. Now, the hardcover edition we were reading from, well, The Great Conspiracy is authored by Michael Sayers, S-A-Y-E-R-S, and Albert E. Kahn, K-A-H-N. Published in hardcover by Little Brown Books. And that's copyrighted 1946, Little Brown, out of Boston. Now, we're going to talk about some soft cover editions of The Great Conspiracy in the second of the two parts of Looking Back from 1984. In addition to The Great Conspiracy, we also, well, Facts and Fascism, we took a look at. Uh, moving on through here. A book called Dulles by Leonard Mosley, copyrighted in 1978 by the Dial Press, hardcover edition. A book, well, once again, Facts and Fascism. A book called Friendship and Fratricide. That was the stuff about Alger Hiss working for the Nye Committee. Friendship and Fratricide, authored by Meyer Zeligs, Z-E-L-I-G-S. And published in hardcover, copyright 67, Viking Press. A book called The Nazis Go Underground, published in hardcover by Doubleday and Duran and Company. Copyright 1944. The Nazis Go Underground was authored by Kurt Reese, last name R I E S S. An article that appeared in the February 1983 issue of Harper's Magazine called Minister Without Portfolio. That had the information about the Assistant Secretary of War John J. McCloy, who you'll recall uh, was the fellow who advocated the sponsorship of Admiral Darlin. Okay. Also, a book called The Capitanios. That was authored by Dominique Yudesh. The Capitania is spelled K-A-P-E-T-A-N-I-O-S about the Greek partisans in the Civil War in Greece. Authored by a man named Dominique Yudesh, last name E-U-D-E-S, who was one of the partisans, by the way, and uh, had uh, a lot of interesting things to say, just blames the whole thing on Stalin. Says Stalin sold the partisans out to the Western Allies. But interesting story. Also, a book, well, the Capitania, as we covered there, we covered a letter in the New York Times, a letter to the editor of the New York Times. Written by Dorothy Sterling. Right, that was from the New York Times of Sunday, March 11th of 1984. We covered a book called Galen, Spy of the Century, authored by a man named E.H. Cookridge, last name C-O-O-K-R-I-D-G-E. Hardcover edition, copyrighted 71. Random House published it in hardcover. Uh, copyrighted, by the way, if you find it in softcover, Pyramid Books uh, issued it in soft cover, copyrighted 73. We took a look at, uh, and Nip read you a passage from uh, The General Was a Spy. That's about General Galen. That book was good. The General Was a Spy, authored by Heinz Hune, H O H N E, and Hermann Soling, Z O L L I N G. It was copyrighted in 1972 in its English language translation, and uh, I don't know what's what's the publisher there. Now that's a long one. That's about six uh, names. Good question. I don't know where it is right now. Um, here it is. Publisher was Coward McCann and Geogian or Geogan, G E O G H E A G A N, Incorporated, New York. So Coward McCann and Geogian. Uh, copyrighted 72, but the general was a spot. I think they're just Coward go. McCann now. Oh. I, th I think they dropped the guy with a long name somewhere yeah. along the line. Oh, okay. well, that's probably just as well. And we also took a look at a book called The Belarus Secret. Belarus Secret authored by a former Justice Department investigator named John Loftus, L-O-F-T-U-S. Copyrighted 1982. And that was published by Alfred A. Knopf and Company, I believe. That's correct. And uh, 
So that covers... Uh, <clears throat> and I think the last ones. one that we that we touched on, we touched on uh, oh. Farewell America and oh, the yeah, uh, Stevenson more. book. Right. Farewell America, authored by ostensibly James Hepburn, H-E-P-B-U-R-N. And that uh, was actually, that's Frontier Publishers, copyright 68. Only 600 copies of that book were brought in by the French Intelligence Service, so it can be found, but you've got to do some looking. And uh, again, there's no such person as James Hepburn. That is actually authored by the French Intelligence Service, S-D-E-C-E. And the last book we looked at was The Borman Brotherhood. That was uh, authored by William Stevenson, S-T-E-V-E-N-S-O-N, because there's another former British intelligence agent turned author named William Stevenson, but that's a different spelling. He is the very famous fellow known as Intrepid. This is a different fellow, and William Stevenson's The Borman Brotherhood, published in hardcover by Harcourt Brace Jovanovich, copyright 73, and in softcover by Bantam Books in 1974, and we read you from the Bantam edition. Okay, now, before we finish up the show, let me make one other point. We had mentioned, I had mentioned, that I was going to give you the name and address of somebody that you might be able to get some of these books from. Let me stress once again, um, this is the only source offhand that we know of where some of these books, especially the old ones, are ever available. If, you know, we have no commercial ties with this gentleman at all, if you, somebody out there who knows about this kind of stuff can find a source, we will be happy to announce it on the air also. There is no monopoly implied here, uh, merely a wish on our part to turn people on to some of this material, which, uh, thanks to the McCarthy era et al., uh, are, uh, these things are no longer available for us. Anyway, so the place that you can write to for a book list that includes many of the sources that we use tonight, if not all, is Tom Davis Books. And the address is P.O. Box 1107, Aptos, California, A-P-T-O-S, Aptos, California, 95001-1107. Let me give that to you one more time. Tom Davis Books, P.O. Box 1107, Aptos, California, 95001 Dash eleven oh seven, and uh, Mr. Davis, I'm sure will be happy to send you a book list. Anyway, okay, so that's the basic plan on what we read tonight. Let me also stress before we finish up here that we will be back on with the second part of this rather extended um, archive <clears throat> and investigation into the the roots of the Cold War on May sixteenth at the same time, seven o'clock, and we will be continuing from where we left off and getting into some more nitty and some more gritty and perhaps some things you are familiar with. Anyway, let me just read you once again, and then Dave also will follow up, the two things that we led the show off with. The first is an excerpt from the book 1984, the very famous novel by, John, by George Orwell that is, of course, uh, was number one on the bestseller list this year um, because this is the titular year. And uh, Mr. Orwell is talking about, uh, the through his narrator, his protagonist, Winston Smith, who lives in Oceania, which is a, a completely manipulated totalitarian state in 1984, in which the past is changed to suit the purposes of the government in power under Big Brother. And uh, Orwell writes as follows. The party said that Oceania had never been in alliance with Eurasia. He, Winston Smith, knew that Oceania had been in alliance with Eurasia as short a time as four years ago. But where did that knowledge exist? Only in his own consciousness, which in any case must soon be annihilated. And if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past, ran the party's slogan, controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. And yet the past, though of its nature alterable, never had been altered. Whatever was true was true from everlasting to everlasting. It was quite simple. All that was needed was an unending series of victories over your own memory. Reality control, they called it. In newspeak, doublethink couple that with the following words of wisdom or cynicism from the 1935 German language edition of Mein Kampf, Hitler's autobiography, again, quoting from Facts and Fascism. Hitler wrote in the, German, in the 1935 German language edition as follows. 
The size of the lie is a definite factor in causing it to be believed, because the vast masses of a nation are in the depths of their hearts more easily deceived than they are consciously and intentionally bad. The primitive simplicity of their minds renders them more easy victims of a big lie than a small one, because they themselves often tell little lies, but would be ashamed to tell big ones. Such a form of lying would never enter their heads. They would never credit others with the possibility of such great impudence as the complete reversal of facts. Something therefore always remains and sticks from the most impudent lies, a fact which all bodies and individuals concerned in the art of lying in this world know only too well, and therefore they stop at nothing to achieve this end. And in closing, I would like to add one more quote from the famous philosopher Santayana, a quote which has been beaten almost to death, but does every now and then resurrect itself and take on a pe peculiar uh, piquancy. And uh, that phrase is, those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And we'll leave you with those thoughts tonight. Let me also just mention as we close out here that you can also, besides waiting for next May 16th, when we continue this series of broadcasts, of course you can tune in to uh, Dave Emery's own show, Hard Rain, which goes on at 11 p.m. on Sunday nights here at KFJC, my own show, One Step Beyond, which goes on at 9 o'clock and runs right into Dave Emery's Hard Rain on Sunday nights, and May Brussels World Watchers International, which is now on at 1 o'clock. It's a different time. <clears throat> so it, it's it's beginning on it's now on currently on at eleven o'clock on Sunday morning, but beginning April twenty second, it will move to two o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesdays, and then beginning May second, it will air a second time each week. It'll air two o'clock Sunday afternoon, and it will be repeated from nine thirty to ten thirty on Wednesday evenings, beginning Wednesday May second. That of course will be aborted once a month for uh, Radio Free America. And, uh, and uh, maybe, uh, who knows, maybe we'll put it in the hard rain slot Sunday night or something, a second broadcast. But at any rate, <clears throat> May Brussels is currently on at 11 o'clock in the morning. That will only go till Sunday, April 22nd, when it moves to 2 o'clock in, in, on Sunday afternoon. And then Wednesday, May 2nd, it will be followed by a second weekly broadcast from 9.30 to 10.30 Wednesday night. Also, hard rain Thursday afternoon from 1.30 to 2. You can see why Dave has such an incredible memory for, for the facts of fascism, just having to keep up with when the shows are playing on KFJC. Unfortunately, my mouth can't quite keep up with the pace of, of, of reading for four hours. It's yet. been a long night. Thank you all for joining us. For Dave Emery and myself, Nip Tuck, thank you very much once again for joining us for this broadcast. Join us on Wednesday, May 16th for the next in the series of the Radio Free America Archive broadcast, the continuation, part two, of Looking Back from 1984, the hidden history of the Cold War. Good night once again. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for listening to us on KFJC 89.7 Los Altos Hills. Views expressed on Radio Free America are those of the participants and not necessarily those of Foothill College, radio station, KFJC, its staff, or management. We recognize our obligation to provide equal time to responsible opposing viewpoints. Either contact us at 12345 El Monte Road, Los Altos Hills, California, 94022, or call us during regular business hours at area code 415-948-8819, extension 260. Now stay tuned for Hazel Bannister. Good night. in the rear of the Red Army to harass the Red Army, and these combined with uh, various uh, domestic fascist and nationalist groups and also with uh, German troops cut off to wage a fierce guerrilla warfare in the rear of the Red Army, and this lasted until 1952, or 1950 by some accounts. I'm going to be reading you now a passage from a book called Galen, Spy of the Century. Galen is G-E-H-L-E-N. It's authored by a man named E.H. Cookridge, last name C-O-O-K-R-I-D-G-E, a former British intelligence agent. And Galen, Spy of the Century was copyrighted in 1971, and it was published in hardcover by Random House in that same year. Now, Galen, Reinhard Galen, was Adolf Hitler's chief of intelligence for the Eastern Front in World War II. We're going to talk about him more in just a second. 
Reading now from E.H. Cookridge's Galen, A Spy of the Century, 1971 Random House Edition. Inside the Soviet Union in Poland, large scattered groups of the whites, unquote, meaning anti-reds, had remained and were putting up a desperate fight. In southwest Ukraine and eastern Poland, bands of the nationalist UPA, many still with their German SS officers, harassed the Red Army, the Polish militia of the communist-dominated Warsaw government, <clears throat> and the local authorities set up in the liberated territories. At various times between November 1945 and the spring of 1947, these counter-revolutionary bandits, unquote, were in effective control of many villages and rural districts. Trained in guerrilla warfare by the Germans, they ambushed Soviet road convoys, used hit-and-run tactics, and carried out innumerable sabotage suffered on both sides. And in a footnote to that passage, uh, Cookridge quotes that Polish military writer, a man named General Ignacy Blum, B-L-U-M. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the Polish name of the history that uh, he wrote that in, but uh, anyway, this, this following footnote to that passage by Cookridge. Report by General Ignacy Blum, Warsaw, 1959. He mentioned a figure of 12,556 killed and estimated the number of sabotage acts carried out in Poland by the anti-communist bands and werewolves, remember that name, werewolves, at 29,970. So we don't know what this raw figure is here, uh, 12,556 killed, whether those represent <clears throat> uh, Red Army casualties in this guerrilla warfare or just what it is that they represent. But uh, note that, that uh, here he's talking about 12, 13,000 people being killed. And uh, keep, in, <clears throat> keep in mind that, as Cookridge said, this guerrilla warfare in Eastern Europe, which, and again, these guerrilla groups, many of them were set up by the Nazis and coordinated by the OKW, German Military High Command, and that uh, basically this guerrilla warfare raged in Eastern Europe until 1952. Now, keep in mind the name werewolves, because that's something Nip Tuck's going to tell you about in a second. Okay, now bear in mind also that similarly to the, the Greek situation, similar to the Greek situation we just described to you, where before hostilities between the Axis and the Allied powers had formally ended in the E-Day, the British were already in essence having a shooting war with the partisans, the anti-fascist partisans. When researchers in Times New York office protested the ina inaccuracy of the foreign news reports, Chambers habitually replied, quote, Truth doesn't matter, unquote. The facts had to be altered to fit his anti-communist crusade. Eventually, the correspondent's protests resulted in, in an investigation, and Chambers was made an editor of, editor of special projects, a position he held until 1948 when he named Alger Hiss as a communist. Whatever views one may hold about the Hiss case, there is no doubt that Whitaker Chambers perjured himself during a grand jury investigation and changed his testimony repeatedly. During the first trial, when Lloyd Paul Stryker said to him, quote, lying comes easy to you, unquote, Chambers replied, I believe so. And that's the end of the letter. So uh, keep in mind, Whitaker Chambers and his, uh, his anti-communist views, his right-wing views, and his systematic suppression of the very stories which we've been trying to resurrect for you uh, through uh, from historical volumes, the stories of the active suppression by the Western allies of uh, anti-fascist partisan movements with whose politics they differed. And indeed, uh, only the tip of the iceberg is what we have time to deal for and deal with tonight. Okay, we're going to take a short break for about three and a half minutes. We'll be back with the last section of Looking Back from 1984. And uh, we hope you'll be back with me. This is Nip Tuck, and myself and Dave Emery will return with the final segment of the show in just a moment here on KFJC 89.7, Los Altos Hills. <laughs> And I certainly hope that those of you who had to get up and run around the block or go walk your guppy or something had the uh, presence of mind to turn on your tape recorder and save this for later days because this is, in essence, why we're doing this stuff. So, anyway, we will be announcing it toward the end of the show, time permitting the books we use tonight. So those of you who are interested in following up on some of this stuff, don't worry about that. Right now, we're going to get back into the subject at hand. And you may wonder, uh, those of you, as I mentioned before, who are beginning to lose the uh, particular forest of the Cold War for the trees of World War II politics, um, may also be wondering about the, uh, the, the Cold War in terms of the United States versus Russia and uh, such things as uh, 
Oh, the uh, the Iron Curtain and the the bringing of Eastern Europe into the the the, the fold of the Soviet wolf in sheep's clothing, et cetera, et cetera, and all the other stuff that we've all heard about, and that in fact ties right in with the partisan stuff that uh, the, those trends and patterns that we talked about, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this segment. Well, now just as we saw the British Army actually take up arms against their nominal allies, the Greek partisans, by the same token. Uh, there was already there was a division of loyalties with regard to the Allies and the Axis in Eastern Europe, which uh, basically resulted in World War II not actually coming to an end until almost 1952. One of the elements of history, very important elements of history, which has not been recorded, is the fact that the shooting war in Eastern Europe, and I'm talking about World War II, did not end in 1945 with VE Day. Basically, as the Nazis retreated on the Eastern Front in World War II, they set up guerrilla groups in the, uh, in the Soviet actions. Indeed, some of the Ukrainian insurgents held out in the forests of the Carpathian Mountains until 1952. The Soviet authorities also encountered trouble in the former Baltic states. After four years of Nazi occupation, many German soldiers, particularly of the Kurland Army, C-U-R-L-A-N-D, which had been cut off during the winter of 1944, had remained there. Together with Latvian and Estonian patriots, they now turned upon the Red Liberators, unquote. The Russians used ruthless, ruthless, ruthless methods to suppress the rebels, resorting to wholesale deportations of the indigenous populations. In Moscow's eyes, the insurgents were traitors who had been armed by the Nazis to fight against their own country. Today, this attitude might appear cruel, especially when taken with the atrocities the Soviet police are known to have committed against often innocent people. Yet it be, must be remembered that the French resistance members treated Nazi collaborators hardly more gently, and that even the British executed traitors after the war for perhaps lesser crimes, such as broadcasting anti-British propaganda from Berlin. Although the Soviet government announced that by the spring of 1947, quote, all counter-revolutionary fascist bands under German command had been annihilated, unquote. In fact, this was not so. For years, the communists kept silent about the extent of the fighting, which in many areas amounted to a minor civil war. Okay, remember that sentence. In many areas, it amounted to a minor civil war. It was not until 1959 that a Polish military writer published some staggering details about the widespread sabotage carried out by anti-communist bands and the heavy casualty 